So I'm Nina Reddy, I'm from the Cambridge team. And <laughs> it's my great honor to moderate this panel, um, uh, Voices from the Front Line. Uh, we have some very inspiring people here on the stage, and we're going to learn a lot from their experiences. Uh, when I was first asked to facilitate this session, I was reading in the news about the devastation caused by a terrible storm, Cyclone Agai, in East Africa, which is a frontline community. So this brought me back to 1978 when I actually visited Mozambique and I went to um, the city of Beira, and this is where the cyclone hit harvest. Um, I visited a program there where they were teaching adults to read. I met with some doctors. Um, so when last month I heard about the cyclone that brought me back to my memories of that place, it was completely wiped out. There was nothing left of there. And uh, people were clinging to roofs and even to trees waiting to be rescued. Um, maybe you saw the pictures, maybe not, because it really wasn't covered much in the US media. Um, but in the, the former first lady of Mozambique, Rasa Michelle, said, clearly said, they was destroyed by climate change. And how much did the people of Mozambique contribute to climate change? Virtually nothing. Most of them don't even have electricity in that So here we're hearing from representatives of frontline communities in the U.S. And these are the first people to suffer the effects of climate change and to suffer disproportionately as we found with um, East Africa. But there are also fighters, activists, fighting back, and we're going to learn from their stories, and we're all in this fight together. Um, so uh, I'm going to do a very brief introduction of the panelists first. Um, after we hear from them, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. But before we do that, we're going to have one more pair share, um, which I'll introduce when we get there. Um, but basically asking you to reflect on what you've heard um, and what it means to you and to think about a question that you might want to ask. Um, so now I will introduce the panelists and <coughs> change the order so I'm going <laughs> to change my order. Okay, so um, we have Lois Bjornsson who lives in Cedary Hill and it's the that area is the most heavily fracked county in Pennsylvania, and she's fighting against that um, through her actions. Um, she has four children, and I um, met the oldest, Nels, who came to dinner at my house last night with Lois. Um, she also te teaches children at her performing arts studio. Um, then we have two people from Virginia, <coughs> Union Hill, Virginia, um, fighting a giant compressor station plan for their community, which is historically an African-American community. And Chad Ova is the co-founder of Friends of Buckingham. She's been active in this struggle for five years. She has three children and three grandchildren and has been in this community for 36 years working as a mental health <coughs> provider. And Ella Rose um, lives very close. She's the closest home to this planned compressor station. She has also been speaking out against it for five years. Um, and she has been described as the family matriarch. <laughs> she has many nieces, nephews, and family members in the area who she cares deeply about. And this Michelle Cook is from an area of Norfolk, Virginia. She um, introduced herself to you a little bit before. There are frequent floods there. They keep children out of school and people in her housing development are losing their homes as a result, and they're also facing a pipeline expansion. Um, Carol. Um, Carol Dyer is from the Woodland, California team, and she um, very sadly lost her home in that terrible campfire. Uh, and Finally, Susan Campbell is a member of Lakeshore Mothers and Others Out Front, and they're fighting for wind power in Lindenville, New York, an economically depressed area where people with second homes are opposing the plans and dividing the community. And Susan has four children and 13 grandchildren. So, <laughs> uh, a big round of applause.
Thank you. <clears throat> so Lois will address you first. Hi, um, I'm very um, honored to be here, and uh, it's quite a privilege uh, to be sitting in front of the people that um, are like-minded, and I appreciate all the work that everyone's doing here in the United States. Um, so what I brought with me today was um, a slide presentation of what myself and my community and my children live around um, throughout the years. Um, technically, I've been doing this work for um, going on five years now, um, but prior to this, we did some work with fighting high tension power lines uh, that were going to be traced across our property, and then tracking boomers uh, amongst us. Um, Washington County, Pennsylvania, um, where I live, is about 40 minutes south of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has uh, banned fracking. They're a very beautiful green city. I love the city. We still live right in the city. Um, however, you know, 15 minutes outside of Pittsburgh in Allegheny County uh, is fracking and pipelines and so on and so forth. But we live in the most heavy fracked line in the state, Washington County. So we've been there now for 15 years. Um, I grew up in the area. My uh, parents um, and ancestral home is still there about 20 minutes from where I live. Uh, I grew up in a small coal mining town that was once thriving along the Monongahela River, and we all know what industry does when they leave. So what I brought here for you was to take a look at what has literally encompassed our home, and I'll ask Amy, uh, I'm sorry, Vanessa over there, to um, pause on a couple of slides so I can explain it a little bit. So this is um, from sort of the beginning of uh, my work within this, just being aware of what's happening and then what, uh, again, is happening around us on a continuous basis. So, you can go ahead and start it. This first slide is my children. This pad is still in existence. If you could press pause. This is my home that um, Red Dog. Uh, this actually slide was, I, this is a wonderful tool. It's called the Oil and Gas Spread Map. Frack Tracker has it. It's an amazing tool. It shows all the pads and facilities and pipelines all around you. Now, this is about six months old. Since then, just in my area, there's been four more new paths. So at last count, it was about 38 paths. And those are just well paths, not including the pipelines, the transmission lines, the gathering lines, the truck traffic. Um, it takes, on, on average, per well pad, uh, 3,500 3, trucks per pad. So we have constant, <coughs> in addition to pollution from this, pollution from diesel fumes, constant truck traffic. Um, everything is trucked in, the sand, the cranes, everything. So that again is an addition. You can go ahead. This is just uh, not half a mile down the road from my house. This is the beginning of the pipelines, another additional pipeline last summer. And this is just how close they're coming to homes and the roads and things. This is one side of the road. This is the other side. Uh, this is now the water that's going through there under the road, and they've cleared, these are 100-foot swaths of trees that they clear. This is the pad that it's connecting to, and then it's connecting the pads on the other side of the road. You could pause on this for half a second. This is a little hard to see. Now, this is this is about 15 minutes from my home, where uh, my pastor lives, and they have big friends. So there's two churches there, and there's a ball field, two ball fields, actually. And this is how close the pipelines come to them. They're about on top of them. Go ahead. And pause here again, I'm sorry. This is not the best picture. And you can see the soccer fields. This is in North Strabane, which again is 10 minutes from my home. My good friends live over there. That's a well pad on the top. You can see all the trucks. This is called EPC Park. This is the energy company that is now in our area. And what they've done, and this is a gorgeous park. There's pavilions, there's soccer fields, there's ball fields. Below it are a few houses and pipelines, but up directly to it. And then next to it, they're now building condominiums. It's EQT Park. They own our townships. This is actually a wealthy community, and they welcome them to the homes. Go ahead. This is the Mark West Compressor Plant. Press pause real quick, I'm sorry. It's my fault. Um, if it doesn't go back, that's okay. So what you, um, there, can you see the flare to the left there, where the way is? Okay, so this burns continuously. The initial plans for this plant were two buildings. It is now over 300 acres. Um, what I'd like to tell about, this is the processing facility where the frack gas goes to so they can separate the gas and send it out. Um, Mark West has had a Santa Cruz. 
I can't remember the number, I think it was $7 billion that they paid in fines. Now, if I had the Santa Fe, one of my only boys, Tom and Doug, of course, <laughs> when they, uh, if they had something like that happen to them, they would be in trouble. We would be in trouble, right? They were allowed to continue to bill, and then they would not accept, they've never accepted public con ever. Recently, they just had a very bad fire there. For some reason, a, a frack truck was on where it shouldn't be, and there was a bad fire, and a bunch of industry workers were there. Go ahead. And this is just, the next couple slides are just more of the Mark West plan. This was a flare that burned off for about eight weeks that you could see from an hour away. This is below just one of the entrances. That has methane in it. That's one of the balls. Um, this is behind, if you could press pause. This is, now, um, people were paid to get rid of their house here, which is what industry always says. We're going to pay you to do all this. They buried this house. This is only part of the meter station you can see. So, so behind that giant Mark West plan are all these pipelines and all these meter houses, and um, there's extremely high levels of methane back there, where people are all living in fresh eggs and so on and so forth. Um, but so it's very house, but what you can't see is directly next to it is another small house. They probably didn't get any money from us. Go ahead. And this is an overview, if you could press pause, of the Mark West plan. And that, again, that started with two buildings, and it's expanded. It's what we call egg slicing permitting in Pennsylvania. You um, apply for one thing, and you do 800. And you're allowed. And you're allowed. Go ahead. Um, this is just a well pad that's not being cracked. Pause. These are called pig launchers. And these are real fun names that industry gives things. So they say, hey, we want to take the farm for some pigs. So all of our farms now are for pig launchers. These are really, really bad. They're not regulated. And what they basically do is they have to vent. So wherever there's a pipe that has to be cleaned up, they drop a pig, a big amount of ball down in it to sort of clean out all the gunk from the wet gas and everything. And then they just shoot it off. Whether it's a geyser, we call it a geyser, or a flare. And I have a really good friend who has three children, and it butts up to her property. It's not her property. Someone else agreed to a pig launcher. It shoots up three times a day. She's in a lawsuit now. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Go ahead. That's, those are the condensing tags that, hold, that separate the wet. This is the spill in a neighboring community that I work in. Get press pause. This is a compressor station. Um, I do some work with Earthworks. They shoot flare footage. You can actually see some of the emissions coming off of this. This compressor station um, is constantly reported to the DEP for leaking. We have a lot, lot, lot of leaks. A lot of leaks. Go ahead. Um, this is my neighbor's house. If you could press pause. Oh, that's okay. No, just okay. This is that well pad at night. So this, this pad right now is not being fracked. And that's the other misconception that industry tells everyone, is that, oh, we'll be there for eight months. Well, now we have the super well pads. So those can consume up to 30 to 40 acres and have an excess of 22 well pads on. So each hole needs drill. It takes between six and eight months for each borehole to be drilled. So this is no longer being fracked, but it's still there. You still have these well pads. These are 50-year projects at minimum, and they tell you it's six to eight months. And my kids play with Cameron, and they get go to school together. This is just that pad at night. It lights up our side yard. And this is the well pad close to my house, a thousand feet. This is just me walking up the bedroom. Um, this is the valve yard that is uh, behind us, because every pad has a valve yard. And those are just one of the signs, and that's the valve yard, and it kisses and makes all kinds of wonderful noises. We could press pause. So these are my four children. This was about a year ago. And why, the reason I put this in here is because, you know, people can look at all these pictures and go, yeah, whatever, it's, you know, a pipeline, we've seen it. But there's a human cause to this. And what I find really interesting about this is, this is when Germany came to our house. We've had Germany in our house, I've had Scotland in the house, I've had Florida in the house, I've had Maryland in my house. To all say, we don't want to do what you're doing. Yeah. That's true. And write articles and like there's people in the New Yorker and all that fun stuff. But you know, that's not what it's about. There's a human cause here, and not just my kids, all of my neighbors' kids. Go ahead. This is just another pipeline down the road. 
um, the 100 foot swaths that they're cutting, it was just all the trees. And the, the gentleman who this is going to take across the valley that you'll see, um, this was last summer. So there he's stretching all the way across. This is an interesting one, keep going. This is the Wagner tank pad. This is what you see. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. And press pause. That's what's there. So you see, did you see the little, like, we call them cardboard cutouts that they put up for the sound walls so you can't see anything? So this is, quote, fresh frack water. So it's okay, because it's fresh frack water. Well, it's not palatable. And there's homes below there, even though I live in the, quote, country, where the next herb was raw from Pittsburgh. Um, could you imagine if one of those just sort of fell open? <laughs> now, now of, of about a month ago, those are now gone. But you'll see why they're gone. Go ahead. Because they're piping water, high pressure water through people's jars. The, that pad's over there, or the tank pad. If you could press pause. So can you see the yellow post there? That's how close these pipelines are to these homes. Now this is an extremely affluent area in Washington, Pennsylvania, which is where the Meadows racetrack is, and there's a big casino, and it's really, really heavily populated. Again, a nice straw from the city. And there's homes everywhere, and it's literally butting up these people's homes. So go ahead, and this is just showing that area. This is, the house is here, this is across the road. That's, again, a pipeline next to another house across the road. That's behind it, and pretty, the next shot is of the valley. You could press pause real quick. So what I showed you initially, what was around my house, you can track this in a small plane and see it. So that's all connecting, which is interesting. Go ahead, press pause. I'm working now in a community that I grew up next to called Mariana, that once was a, again, huge thriving culture, and there's not 500 people that live there. That's a very environmental justice community. And this is my friend Kim. This is off of her porch. Um, this is in Marina Borough, which is surrounded by um, West Bethlehem Township. She had no notice of this. None of the people did have no notice of this. Flows and all of the hatch <coughs> houses that live there. What you can't see is there's the owner's house over here and an in-ground impoundment that is as large as a um, football field where the kids catch the bus next to. Um, and they're slated for four more paths. This is a 17 4 fold well path. And that pipe, which I thought was water, she said, no, that's our raw sewage running through there because they caved in the side of the hill. Again, go ahead. This is the compressor station by my house. Um, this is the expanding of it. It's a sand pit, so now we have the fun silica sand where they mix it. That's some of the trucks. That's fabulous caliber truck. Press pause. So there's two wall pads. We have no zoning in our area, so pads can be, you know, a thousand feet from each other. They have a lot of them like that. Um, and they put up, that's the fun sound wall, like, you know, I don't know what that does. They hide what they're doing. They put stuff up on top of hills so you can't see them. And then in the summer, when the foliage comes, you can't see anything, unless they're flaring them up or something of that sort. My friend um, and neighbor used to live there. Um, she woke up, they did sign a leave, she thought it was sort of all path across the road, and they were 300 feet from the house with bulldozers. Um, they have moved, had to move, and, um, but industry told them to, just go get a hotel for the first year, we'll pay for it, because that's the worst. work. So, go ahead. This is the pad, that's my third son there, just to show this. Press pause real quick. This is the drainage pond that was built two years too late, and so all the water from that pond and the other pond drained up into the aquifer where we live. We get notices every single quarter um, from our public water source, source which is the Monongahela River, of total trihalo methane that are above drinking water standards, and they say it's okay. It's not for a long time. We've had it for 10 years. Go ahead. And this is just behind that, and you can see the house at the bottom of one of those paths. This is a dairy farm, that's false. And I'm showing you all these pictures. I know a lot of these people, they're good friends for us. My kids went to school together, their kids took class for me. I love these people to death. 
they've been highly successful. This pad actually is about 1,600 feet from their dairy farm where I used to go get raw fresh milk, which I don't do anymore. Um, but it doesn't mean that I still don't like these people and that we're still not good friends. Go ahead. And this is just an aerial footage of it. Just work on St. Tanks down the road. Another, the next one is a huge pig launcher down the road. This is just to show you the size. Constant Energy owns about 15,000 acres. This is the run from a pad. You can see the house below. Um, these are deer. And this, they ran away when we took this picture. This is what they drank out of, which is the run from a pad. This is a set, this is a church we, we go to, and there's the pad. We could press pause real quick. This slide just came to me literally before the day before I got here. My friend Matt and Holly with the Breed Collaborative. This came out. So you can see the red dot down there. That's us, and that's Claritin, Pennsylvania, the Claritin Folk Works, and our area, and the other red dots of the worst air quality that we have. And then the last slide, okay, this is the petrochemical hub. Press pause. We are the next petrochemical hub. Um, they are proposing now five petrochemical hubs. This is the first one being built in Beaver, where my two oldest children go to school. And the next one is in Belmont County, Ohio. It's 45 minutes from our house. So they're moving everything from Louisiana to our area because of climate change. Is that funny? <laughs> and go ahead. And these are just these are my kids. You can see from the beginning to now they're still growing up with this. Um, and I'd like to add that my third son there, Gunner, is blonde hair and blue eye, and uh, my other friend's children are red hair and red eyes. And not because I'm sorry, blue eyes. And they they have they're more susceptible to things. And so he has it the worst. Now, to some of you met, he uh, had all of her body rash. Um, Des has had exasperated asthma. Um, Ghana gets really, really severe nosebleeds if we leave the um, windows open. Um, they, three of my four children have had climate change. I'm not climate change. Uh, Lyme disease due directly to climate change. Um, so these are all impacts from climate change and fossil fuels. Um, so thank you. Eye opening. All right, we're going to ask. Um, Thank you. Uh, we don't want that to happen anywhere else. We really don't. Boy. Um, our story began with uh, a proposal for a compressor station in our county. Um, started smaller and grew. They started with about 20,000 horsepower. Then it was 35, now we're up to almost 58, which is the largest dominion that's ever built in the whole country. Um, we did a demographic study. I, I knew where I lived. I, I lived near Ella. Uh, and I, I knew that it was an African-American neighborhood, but we had to prove that. So we did our own door-to-door -door demographic study and determined how conclusively it's 83% African-American. This didn't seem to matter when we went, and we've been through the whole regulatory process. It's been a very, you know, we had to go through the Board of Supervisors who thought there was just grand to this presentation here in, in our very rural county. It was small agriculture, um, but that, we'll, we'll take care of that. We fought it very hard. We had a lot of help. We had mothers of front allies at our meetings, uh, of the uh, hearings. But it went through. So then we started the regulatory process, which doesn't seem to work, folks. It really doesn't, I'm afraid. Um, <clears throat> but we are creating a record. Uh, the water board, sure, it's fine. Uh, 17,000 comments. People did not want this to be impacting their water. So many thousands of streams, two national forests, uh, across the Appalachian Trail, uh, headwaters for the water that supplies Washington, D.C. None of this seemed to matter to our DEQ. They went ahead and, and went ahead with this. So I said, sure, do it. Um, then it came to us and the Air Board. 
uh, or the first DEQ uh, folks. And they said, sure, go right ahead, despite, I think we had something like 6,000 comments um, saying no, no, and many, many good reasons why, scientific expert uh, testimony. Um, okay, uh, then we went to the Air Board, which is supposed to be an unbiased citizen board of uh, experts. We had two members on this board who questioned us who said, but isn't this disproportionately affecting an African-American neighborhood? Oh no, no, it's not at all, DEQ said. It was like DEQ was speaking for the industry. I mean, we've all heard this captured, captured. They were definitely captured by Dominion. They based their census report on the overall county, how many African-Americans, how many white. And Native Americans, by the way, don't even get counted. Okay, and we do have African, I mean, Native Americans. Okay, so we said, no, 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 this is the real, we went door to door. And we had this certified by somebody who does such things, an anthropologist working with us, that didn't seem to matter. Okay, after these Air Board members questioned this at the hearing, our governor, got rid of them within five days after that and replaced them. Some of you may have heard of our governor and his other <laughs> racist antics. Um, and he's supposed to be doing a tour of the state and rectifying all these things. We have repeatedly asked him to come to Union Hill. He's been asked individually by citizens, He's been asked by Pastor Paul Wilson, where we have all of our meetings for the last five years in, his, in the local church. He will not come. He will not come. There's always a good excuse. Yeah, he won't come. He won't, he won't face up to this. So here we are. Um, almost 200 tons per year of toxic emissions about 45 particulate matter. We have air monitors in people's homes now. Uh, we've done our own water testing. We've done everything. We've done everything we can think of to protect ourselves. Ella, I'll let Ella tell you her story. But we, we need to shift from surviving to, to thriving. And somebody said earlier, was it Amy? that it's love that does it. Love is action. And for me, learning, learning about my own white privilege has been really informative for me. And getting to know my neighbors so much better than I ever did before. And being able to develop those relationships that are so important and that you all are doing, um, that's the great gift of this. And, and that's the love. That's the love. And we need to keep doing more of that. I'm sorry I'm getting into this whole other part of me that just so strongly stays committed to this. But it's the only way I can keep going, is, is to keep going back to my heart. Is keep going back to my heart. Um, so here we are. We we've got uh, the compressor station has been approved. Um, we're still fighting. I mentioned earlier we have four suits. Um, the Southern Environmental Law Center is representing us. They really don't take a suit unless they feel as so though they've got a good chance of winning. So we're feeling like. We might win this. We might win this and stop this thing. Okay, we have a, a little video, and before Ella speaks, could we show the video? And it's it just I'm it's water, 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 share process, and we work day and night to get this is our history, and that's why we don't want none of this to come through. They're just trying to do that that really don't exist. And they're also basically saying that our lives don't matter. 
At the center of the full pipeline is Union Hill, a community built by the descendants of freed slaves. It is here that Dominion is planning to construct a 57,000 horsepower compressor station. We are in the zero zone, in other words, University. My great grandparents were sharecroppers here, and it, it makes you angry to think that. To think that something they worked so hard for, and this land that is so beautiful and means so much, and this land gives so much to us, this can all be gone. When natural gas is compressed into the liquid, it releases toxic fumes in the air. The sections of life on the ground and pressure stations most likely to leak or explode. We know that it will be there in the course of this gas. We know that. And we know that it will get up and contaminate the water. They don't look at what happens when you do a blow down, which means a lot more is going to the air, which is when a lot of people do get sick. It's happening to blow downs. Residents have to this cattle on the roof of the union and each way it was back. So far, we postponed the whole certification process over a year to constant activity at all levels. Buckingham County is in the heart of this pipeline project. That's why it's such an important place to focus. We are now just recently in to the Prime State Center. That's where a lot of the freedom names came from, which group a lot of names. Clayton, Austin. We want to pass this land down to our family. We from my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, myself, and we have nephews that will need to go down to them. So many generations. And with this compressor station coming, we may have nothing. This community will have 80 properties in that block. Or else that's why we say this area has no culture or Natural resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is <laughs> After three years of being dismissed of all the hearings, residents prepared to escalate the protests of environmental racism and the alignment of the pipeline. So, if this is. Uh, just update, it's been three years we've held them off. Three years. Okay. And, and I just, just want to say also, we're working with such a diverse culture, and there were people there from a nearby, nearby intentional community called Yogaville, and we've allied very closely with them. So you know, we've got yogis and Baptists and farmers and low income, and some middle income, mostly low income. Um, so we're, we're just, we're doing transformative work. We really are. And it's been wonderfully educational and terribly demoralizing at times. But we're going on and we've got a good chance. Thank you. Yeah, I'm worried that we're going to lose. It's, it's not okay. So after high school, I moved to Maryland and D.C., where I worked for 51 years. I, re I retired in 2010 and relocated in Buckingham County in 2012. 2014, long came the composed pressure station project. My home is only 150 feet away from the property that Dominion purchased to place to compress the station on. It's only one third mile away from the transco line that they put there in, in the late 60s, which has four lines. They're going to connect the Atlantic Coast Pipeline to the AC Pipeline. Um, my home is only one third mile from the composed pressure station, one third mile from the man camp. The telecommunication tower is only like 900 feet. 
and my well is only maybe two, two city blocks away from the, uh, the line. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried about my well water, I'm concerned about my well water and the breeze clean air. They are putting, they are placing this compressor station right in the middle of a historical black community where my ancestors are uh, buried. It's been very depressing and, and nerve wracking to be speaking for the last four and a half years. It's getting better. And with the help of all of the mothers out front and the other organizations that have given support, that I'm hopeful that we will bring us out of this situation. So, it's nerve wracking to be sitting here, I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> We have someone working for the division that came up with the Plan B and divided our community. It's hard mentioned that you know you have to go to church and worship with your fellow man that has betrayed you for money. I refuse to give up. I'm not going to. Hello again. <clears throat> Dominion Power and Colonial Shipyard, which is right there at the Elizabeth City, downtown North, <coughs> Harbor Park, Amtrak, my community, and other communities lost um, intimate domain against Dominion as to how far under that business to drill. It's a ticking time bomb with Dominion and that being under that business because what you have at the shipyard can explode at any time. Temperature-wise, those tanks, you got the picture. I have not, uh, because of, as I shared earlier, an incident that happened in December, there was two reports the mayor and the city manager was to get. But before they got that report, I had the opportunity to have at the country club a sit down with face to face with the mayor, city manager, and a few other people about a report that they were supposed to be getting. We was hoping that this easement will not be approved. As I stated earlier, I go out my back door, the pipeline is there. Water that sits shouldn't be sitting in the school field, on the street, in front of the middle school, in front of the other schools, underpass is holding water. We have the housing situation. I'm in a community of 618, the next community 400, the next community 740. This is something they're gonna do across America by 2030. Affordable housing, low-income housing to be gone. I worked as a CNA, private duty security, and fast food at the same time to provide for myself and my three sons. I can't go out there in the workforce at 60 almost to work those kind of hours. 
to just have a roof over my head. If you do not have housing, you are not considered a human being. I don't know if you all knew that or not. A physical address where some places are not even accepting a post office address. Twelve years ago, I received a kidney transplant. Eleven years prior to that, I was on uh, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis. I had to come out of the workforce, still with three children, to support. Child support, that's a joke to me because I don't know what it is. I tried not to, at that time, to rely on my parents because you're supposed to go out into the world, conquer the world. Back in the 80s, I did clean air. That's what got me more conscious then. Kim Miller came into our community and introduced me to the, um, the, the head man of the Armored Corps of Engineers. All these maps in the room showing our community at the foot of the Elizabeth, Elizabeth River shelter. And I told him eye to eye, that map needs to be thrown out and you all need to figure out where the residents are gonna go because it's in the flood zone. Why, to me, why put up a map if you know it's in the flood zone, but you put a smirk on your face? I don't know if you all know that history from the first century, we are living it, what they already experienced from the first time of man and woman. It's just new to us. As I stated earlier, and as we know, we need the person that's sitting at the hem to wake up. We need the people around him to wake up. I saw the truth to power with Al Gore standing on top of a glacier. For me as a child, I thought it was nothing but ice. I would have never thought we would see it disappear. Climate change is real. Someone stated earlier, it is coming from Africa and it starts and trickles down. So what we are experiencing is not new to the earth, but it's new to <coughs> us. And we do need to come together and figure out a way to make this person, who is my elder, I, I've been taught to respect my elders, to realize it is humans. It is us that makes the world go round, not a building. Buildings and stuff are beautiful, but it's the people that makes the function. I don't care what your nationality is. I know sometimes it gets in the way for certain people, but it shouldn't. If you work, if you need housing, you need education, you need transportation, that's across the line for everyone. We're dealing with the housing, we're dealing with the pipeline, we're dealing with uh, flooding, we're dealing with flash flooding, we have water that's standing, a seawall. Excuse my language. To me, it's a joke because it's not protecting the whole city. Um, I'm hoping, as long as I don't lose my hope and it spreads. We as mothers out front are gonna do more than we think possible. But I, I think I wanna say, if you have not been in a low income community to realize what you do, we do too. We have challenges. Transitioning, we always transition. Constantly, every day. 
We want safety, we want housing, we want education, we want to be able to go further, we want better pay. And if we can get the living minimum wage passed across the board for which they do not want to do, that may be another challenge for us as mothers out front. <laughs> to speak um, soon after speaking with Gary Mandry on that video uh, to come and talk about my experience as a campfire. And my biggest takeaway about the campfire is about accountability and that I know growing up I didn't really have much of a role model besides you know my teachers who were mostly women who were like my mother and I was their daughter instilled in me to be accountable of my own actions and how to be responsible for those actions that I take. My spouse and I have always been conscious about um, our environmental impact and carbon footprint. My husband, he's an entomologist at UC Davis. I was gonna start school at Butte College this year to study nursing and eventually become a midwife, but since November 8th, that's kind of changed. Well, my plans are kind of gone, and I'm kind of left wondering, what, what do I really want to do? Because even though on an individual level, I've been accountable of what I've done in contributing in climate action, but corporations like PG&E are still attempting to this day, even though they are at fault on the record for all the fires that have been happening in California. The, de the day before, November 7th, uh, many residents in Butte County received notification that they would be uh, shutting down the town's power because it had to be expected for high winds and the dry conditions um, were going to be a fire hazard, a potential fire hazard. Well, it, the interesting thing is that Northern California was on a red flag warning and Southern California was on a fire warning. And I remember speaking to, um, I used to be a caregiver. <laughs> um, I went to my client's house and we would always talk about PG&E and what they were doing and pushing, increasing our rates to pay for their uh, court fees that they had to pay for the fire that happened in San Bruno due to a faulty pipeline. And I mentioned to them, I was like, well, I guess they will shut down the power, you know. We got all the notification, and hey, hopefully that actually happens, because every time we got a notification, nothing would happen. But getting up on November 8th at 5.30 in the morning, my power was still on, so I went out all of my normal day. I was just getting ready for work, and seeing, the, I would always see the sunrise sitting on my living room. I noticed that the light coming in through the house was a bit orange, and I was like, hmm, that's odd. Looks like there's a fire somewhere, because Northern California, we're always gonna have fire. There's always been a fire. A couple of months prior, there was the car fire in Reading. Once I stepped outside, um, when I was getting ready to go to work around eight o'clock, I noticed ash falling from the sky, and I thought, I was like, it's snowing, or is that ash? <laughs> I mean, these, I was like, what the fuck, you know? I'm sorry for my language, but it was just like, I saw ash, and I also saw he, chunks of charcoal, char shards of trees, and I'm like, this is, this is pretty close. And right there, if you go back, I went to my car, noticing, a lot of particles look like snow, and I, I just smudged my finger, and I'm like, oh no, this is pretty close by. I posted on my Facebook page and be like, the fire's pretty close. 
at that moment, I called my husband and asked him to check um, if there was an evacuation warning or anything. If there was a fire going on, he checks pg and he checks uh, CAL FIRE website, and it had been notified. There was a fire, but there was no evacuation. There was no warning. While I'm on my route to my client's house, I noticed that vehicles were driving by really fast and radically, and I'm like, what? what's going on? And in the direction that my client lived, he was closest to the fire, not knowing that he would have already been evacuated. I was heading in that direction. Seeing all of the cars driving even faster in the opposite direction, and then suddenly noticing even more ash falling from the sky, I didn't notice the car in front of me stop trying to get into history so he can get to his house and get to his mom so they can evacuate too. I ended up rear-ending him. It wasn't too bad, I wasn't going that fast, but still, <laughs> did significant damage, not too bad. My, drive, my car was still drivable. I call 911 and immediately the dispatcher tells me, if you're calling about the fire, There's a mandatory evacuation for the entire town of Paradise. I told her I wasn't calling for that. I was just in an accident. And the only thing he said, is your car drivable? Is the other car drivable? And I said, yes. Then just leave. Responders will not be getting to you. And this was at 8.03. So, uh, I did what I did, supposed to do, because it's the right thing to do, exchange information with the person, so, because I, I did ruin them, my fault. I went back home, and in the direction that I was going back home was still, it's only three miles away from where the fire was at, but it was like a 10 minute drive. I could still see a blue sky, but to the left of me, it was starting to turn black. I get to my house. I tell my landlord who was fixing up my neighbor's house because he owned both my neighbor's house and my house. And I told him, you need to leave. There's an evacuation. We all have to go. And by this time, it's pitch black. Turn to the next pitch. So I, I got to see blue skies, but then suddenly it just turns black. I mean, it was still orange. We still had the sun, but the sun was blood red at that moment. And this is at nine o'clock. From when I found out, one hour, you know, my day turned into night. I finally just uh, grabbed everything that I could. My MP3 player, my computer, my bike, whatever clothes I could grab left behind my passport because I totally was not thinking about that. I started hearing explosions from the natural gas pipes that people had and sometimes the trees because it was dry and the intense heat was making them pop. I get into my car and I'm trying to leave the street that I live on, but it's back to back. It's pitch black. I had no idea whether I was going to get out alive or just die where I was at. Because when I, right before getting into Pearson Road, which was my only way out of my neighborhood, I started seeing what was once black sort of glowing red. I managed to, you know, I'm still here, so I managed to get out. But nothing's really the same anymore. The next week, they had people with uh, trailers or like pickup trucks that would tow, remove the vehicles off the road to allow first responders and other construction workers to repair and make it safe to, for residents to go back and assess the property damage. I didn't get 
We didn't get the clear until December 18th that we can go back, but my husband and I decided to go the day before Christmas. Turn to the next. Where I'm standing would have been my bedroom. And I told my husband, I didn't have, I lost my boots I had for 10 years, so the shoes I'm wearing is what I wore that day. And he had boots on and I told him, I was like, that's where all my, all my beads, my crafting stuff would be at. And he went to search for whatever that was eligible, but really it was only one mushroom bead made out of glass that actually survived that I got from a music festival that I attended from just someone who just saw my outfit and just gave it to me. She so turn to the next slide. That's my neighbor's yard. Their house where the white fence would have been at. All that's left is a fence that my landlord <coughs> had just put in that day of the fire. And then the next picture. Where I'm standing, I should have been three feet higher. There was a fence that would surround the yard. I had a plum tree and an apple tree right in front where the car would have been at. A railroad tide where we had a colony of wood ants. And that basically was our just last day of being there, being what used to be our home. My spouse grew up in paradise, but at that time he was at Davis. PG&E is definitely responsible for this fire. And the record has shows and proven by court that they are, but they had literally that day or the next day attempted to declare bankruptcy. So they don't have to pay for their responsibility in what happened and what had contributed to the fire. I know as, I'm not a mother, but I know I'm someone's daughter. And I know that mothers do have a stronger voice. You know, there's, and especially right now when I don't really feel like I have a voice anymore to speak. For me, this is the best I can do and sharing my story and hoping that everyone will know I could have been your child, but I could also have not made it. Because where I lived, that's where the fire burned the hottest and fastest. Out of the 84 individuals that passed away due to the fire, Majority of them were on the road that I was on, but they were about probably 50 feet behind me. So I'm hoping that, you know, we can make sure that these large corporations who have neglected to be responsible <coughs> in maintaining their infrastructure that provide the necessities that we need to continue on living. To make sure that they're accountable, that just because they're a corporation, there also need to be a coexistence. Paradise was not an affluent community. Um, nickname given that when I moved to Paradise was called Poverty Ridge. 55% were retired individuals on income, on fixed income, Social Security. 
a good majority of them were also dis disabled. Everybody else was just, you know, low income students, small families just starting out. We have gotten national attention, but it just feels like everybody's uh, moved on already. I mean, I, I still struggle to call Woodland my home because I just don't want to get attached anymore after losing what was my home. Yeah. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak. And I hope... <laughs> And I hope that everybody else that has a stronger voice can carry on my voice with them. <laughs> Picking back off of her story, I heard of a family in California. They, the fire came up on them so fast, they couldn't leave. But what saved that particular family was their swimming pool. They jumped in the swimming pool as the flames were coming over. The water heated up. But I guess some kind of way God worked on their behalf that it cooled it down for them to get out once the fire passed over. <coughs> wow, I don't even know how to... I, know, right? follow. I don't even know how to follow that. Um, also, I'm really super nervous, so I wrote everything down. <laughs> I really, really love the same thing this. But... So, my name is Susan Campbell, and I live near the shores of Lake Ontario in Lindenville, New York. I grew up there, and I raised my children there. When I was six years old, my mother divorced my father because he was physically abusive. Because of her, I learned at a young age that we do whatever we need to do to protect the people we love and make sure that they're safe, even if it is a hard thing. As a young teen in the 70s, I participated in the first Earth Day. My Earth science teacher, Mr. Kenyon, um, had a poster that hung in his room, and it was an earth with an ear on each side of it. And the caption said, Mother Earth's greatest problems lie between the ears of mankind. <laughs> he told us that every person can make a difference and that the care of the earth is the, it should be a priority for everyone. And so... I was determined that I was going to be that person. So you fast forward to about five years ago, and there was a wind turbine project proposed in my community, and I was really excited. Um, turbines, I think turbines are beautiful and peaceful, and they're a huge part of transitioning off of fossil fuels. Turbines are the number two solution for climate change in the book Drawdown by Paul Hawkins. If you have not read the book, you really need to get it. Um, after some research, I jumped in with both feet because that's kind of the person that I am and started promoting and supporting the turbines coming. I believed that our little town could make a difference. We can make a difference in the fight for climate change and at the same time, the turbines could make a difference for our little town because the town I grew up in is dying. There used to be mom and pop grocery stores and little diners where the community would come together and we would talk and visit. And, but now there's just dark windows and locked doors. Um, the turbines would make a huge difference in the economy of our community. There'd be money for our schools, money for the fire department, tax breaks, maybe even the town park. 
It would be so nice to have a place to take our kids. Um, our first hurdle was getting and uh, getting the local support involved, believe it or not, was the developers and of the project and the larger green organizations. Um, they came into our community and they decided they knew what was best for us. They knew how it worked. The developer told us, we know how this works. We know what to do. You know, went on to mansplain to us you know, <laughs> how, how we were going to do this, right? And uh, so I actually had one of the people from one of the larger green organizations tell me that they knew what would work better in my community than I did because they knew that my community better than I did. She'd been there two times and she lived almost 500 miles from where I live. So that was, that was one of the hardest things when we first got started. So the developer got a new public affairs person, thank God, and she was a woman, thank God, <laughs> and things started to change because she realized that in order to make any kind of a forward moving action, the people who lived in the town had to be the ones who were listened to. We were the ones it was affecting. We were the ones that were going to get the benefit from it. And we were the ones that were on the front lines. So she pushed and we started getting listened to. And there was a large, we were growing a group of people um, to help get it approved through the Article 10 process. In New York State, there's a process that for any energy that's over 25 megawatts, I believe it is, has to go through this big, long, arduous process. So we were pushing to help with that. We thought we were up to the challenge. And then we got smacked in the face by the opposition. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. You know, the climate change deniers, the skewed totally false information. You know, the, the lobbyist, the bottomless funding that comes from nowhere and just keeps on coming and coming. The thing is, in our community, in our town, the majority of the antis that started the, the process about stopping the turbines don't live in our town full time. They have cottages on the lake, and they live in places where they have grocery stores right down the street. We have to drive at least 10 miles to get to a grocery store. Um, the closest place there is for us to buy clothes is a Walmart that's almost 20 miles away. They have no idea what our town is like. And they, the majority of our people in my town are farmers and blue collar workers. Many of us can't even afford to go on a vacation, let alone own a vacation home. So we need the revenues from this project to encourage businesses to come to our town something to open up those locked doors and put lights in those dark windows. So these part-time residents started a group to oppose the turbines. Um, they spread completely false information. They used intimidation, like name calling. I was called a wind whore at a public meeting. Um, among other equally horrible things, um, I was also told at a public meeting that there was no way I could possibly love my grandchildren if I wanted the turbines to come to our town. So you can imagine there weren't a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon saying, hey, let me come and get screamed at and called names. So it's, it's been a really tough fight. So what we did, well, first of all, I have to say that they notified people in New York State, you can change your voter's registration to vote anywhere that you have a connection to. So what they did is they tapped one of the local people that was against the turbines to run for our town board. And then they sent out flyers and emails to all of their friends change your voter registration and use my cottage as your address. 
We had 44 people change their registration to our town. We only have about 1,200 people in our whole town. Um, the local incumbent only lost the election by 14 votes. So the only agenda that this board has is stopping the turbines. They've been in for three years. They have not done one other thing in our town except fight the turbines. So we were still working to organize support, and then I met Neely. I don't know where she is. Um, she's one of the organizers from Others Out Front in New York, and she understood how important local voices are. She knew that the people who are going to be affected need to be the ones who are given the power to speak. So it's been about two years since we started our team and went to work. We do social media, canvassing, tabling, public information meetings, and what I like to call protests with a capital P-R-O, <laughs> and speaking at board meetings. Um, we have a core team of about 12 or 14, um, and ours is called Mothers and Others out front because I have just as many gentlemen as I have women in my group, but I figured they had a mother, so <laughs> that works, right? <laughs> So, and we've got about 50, 50 or 70 that like we can call to show up at things or write a letter or something like that. Another point that I want to make is, oh, before that, we have a petition that's going to be going to our governor because there is, there is a part in the Article 10 that the governor can override laws that are, are unfair, that are passed to stop turbines from coming. So we started a petition, and you can go on the Mothers Out Front thing and look under Lakeshore Mothers and Others, and there's a petition for people who do not live in our community who support the people in our community in our fight. And I would appreciate if everybody would go on and sign on to that for us because we are planning on, on after Mother's Day, taking the Mother's Day cards and the petition to the governor. So another point I want to make before I finish up is that our team made a conscious decision that we weren't going to use the anti tactics. We speak with truth and with facts and with kindness to everyone, even the antis, even the woman who called me a wind for, I speak to her and smile at her and ask her how she's doing because I refuse to become them. So we have a plan. We have a plan for mobilizing with training on how to speak effectively to our officials and community members about climate change and how turbines are an important part of the transition. A plan for growing with canvassing and tabling to let people know that we're here and we really want them to join the fight with us. And a plan for winning with the voice of mothers, caregivers, and allies rising up and fighting for a just and livable earth for our children, our grandchildren, and the generations to come. I know that at times it seems like a really daunting task, but we have to keep on fighting because there are no do-overs, there is no planet B, and I know that my mom would be very proud. Yeah.